Last time we were in the Gospel of Luke, we examined the necessity of believing in the veracity or truthfulness of the virgin birth. And we looked at several reasons as to why we are staunch defenders, especially as we walk through this passage, of why we believe the virgin birth to be none other than the virgin birth. For the four reasons were we believe in the virgin birth because we trust the Bible to be the inerrant word of God. The Bible says she is a virgin, and uh, she says that herself uh, several times. The virgin's name was Mary. Uh, she was a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, and then later on, in verses 35, 34 and 35, it's going to stay that way. How will this be? How will I have a child since I am a virgin? The Bible says it right there. She is a virgin, and she's going to stay a virgin until Christ is born. But we also believe in the virgin birth because we recognize the power of God to do the impossible. The angel's guarantee to Mary is found in verse 37. For nothing will be impossible with God. There's no scientific explanation of this. We, we can't really wrap our minds around this. But because the Bible said it and we believe the Bible, but we also know that the power of God is uh, beyond fathomable, that this, what seems impossible to us, is possible with God. So we believe in the Word of God, we believe in the power of God, but we also believe in the confession of the church. We believe in the virgin birth because believers from the earliest days of the early church confessed this great truth that Christ became the God-man by being conceived by the Holy Spirit in the womb of Mary. We're following that great tradition throughout history. But we also believe in the virgin birth because it has massive implications for Scripture's truthfulness and trustworthiness. It impacts Christ's deity and humanity. It also, as we saw last time, a massive implications for the nature of grace in the new birth. So for those reasons, we believe in the veracity of the virgin birth. Yet we do not proclaim the virgin birth because we are able to understand every aspect of it, but because this mystery is full of great theological truth. We do not understand how this was accomplished in scientific terms and practices, but we do know and trust that this was God's plan from before the creation of the world. And through the virgin birth, it preserves for us the divinity and the humanity of Christ to be conceived by the Holy Spirit and then born of a virgin. I know also that this revelation to Mary and the meaning of this news has a massive impact on our salvation. And that's why we re rejoice with what we read in our text. Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. But today I really want us to focus on the first few verses, verses 26 through 30 which focus on Mary. I want us to focus on Mary today. Not our Mary, although we love this Mary, but Mary, the mother of Jesus. Let's read Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 26. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. 
And coming in, he said to her, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was very perplexed at this statement and was pondering what kind of greeting this was. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. But let's look at the angel's greeting this morning, shall we? And see what we can learn about Mary and apply to our own lives. Just a brief note about the angel's itinerary. We need to ask, when was this? And Luke says it happened in now in the sixth month. Now I'm looking for a connection here. What is this sixth month connected to? So I'm reading up and down this passage in the context to try to find what this possible connection could be because it, it's almost like Luke just threw out uh, as a grenade this sixth month. Is it, what year is it? Was this describing the sixth year of their, or sixth month of their relationship? Was this six months of Gabriel's service to the Lord? What is this six months related to? Well, fortunately, Luke does connect the, the loose end, I believe, in verse 36. Behold, your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month for her, who is called barren. So, I think it's a very likely scenario, reasonable, that this is the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy when this occurs. If we go back six months earlier, what had happened? We look at verse 8, it happened that while Zechariah was performing his priestly service before God in the order of his division according to the custom of the priestly office, he was chosen by lot to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and burn incense. The whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of the incense offering, and an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the altar of incense. Zechariah was troubled when he saw the angel, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will call his name John. And since this is the only clear and explicit match, it's quite reasonable to believe this connection, that this is in the sixth month, of Elizabeth's pregnancy that the angel Gabriel goes from heaven in the presence of God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth. Now where is this? Nazareth really is described by some commentators as a non-place. A non-place. It's not mentioned in the Old Testament. It's not mentioned in Josephus' writings or in the rabbinical writings. In fact, it wasn't until 1962 that a pre-Christian mention of Nazareth was found at Caesarea Maritima. Now, the later prominence of the city, of the town, really, is a result of the Christian gospel. Nazareth, a shoddy, corrupt, halfway stop between the port cities of Tyre and Sidon, was overrun by Gentiles and Roman soldiers. In fact, you remember in John 1, when the straight-talking Nathaniel mentioned Nazareth, he, he asked, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Implying that it was probably miserably corrupt. By consensus, Nazareth was not much. Of course, in skipping Judea and Jerusalem, Gabriel also ignored the temple, the most holy place in Israel, and entered the lowly home of Mary, which was certainly not much. As we've mentioned several times now, the angel's identity is Gabriel. The angel Gabriel was sent from God. He had been commissioned by God to reveal the news of an upcoming pregnancy 
for Zechariah and Elizabeth, and he is also going to be sent to share a startling announcement to a young woman named Mary. Here, Gabriel comes from the presence of God. He has direct access to God, and thus he is a very credible source. In fact, when Gabriel gave the message to Zechariah, and he couldn't believe what he was hearing, how did he respond to Zechariah? In a very careful but powerful reminder, verse 19, the angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel who stands before God. I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. So where he stands and the message he was sent to speak is a powerful reality that he is a very credible source. But all throughout this, the tone of the setting of Jesus' birth matches the tone of his ministry. The great God of heaven sends the gift of salvation to humans in a serene and unadorned package of simplicity. Now what were the angel's intentions as he comes down from heaven, out of heaven, to a city in Galilee called Nazareth? Well, of course, it was to share this second startling birth announcement. Let's meet the family in verse 27. Luke immediately says, To a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, and the virgin's name was Mary. Mary, first of all, is a virgin. This reality is attested to three times in this passage, and that word is parthenos, which is never used of a married woman, and thus is implied that there was no sexual relationship. Even Mary herself confirms this. And Matthew 1, 23, Matthew's account, confirms this as well. Behold, the virgin shall be with child, shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. Now she is betrothed to Joseph. Just a little historical note on Jewish betrothals. Betrothal, betrothal lasted for a year, and it was... Uh, Quite as binding as marriage, it could be only dissolved by divorce. Should the man to whom the girl was betrothed to die, in the eyes of the law she was a widow. In the law there occurs the strange sounding phrase, a virgin who is a widow. Once two people were betrothed, there was a bond between them which nothing but death could break. If her betrothed husband died, the girl would be considered a widow. The couple did not live together or have sexual relations during this period. And during that year, the girl was to prove her faithfulness and purity, and the boy was to prepare a home for his bride-to-be. When the year was up, there was a seven-day wedding feast. And we see that in Matthew 25, John 2. That's the setting for those. After which, the couple began their life together as husband and wife. Only then was the marriage consummated. According to the reputable history of Jerusalem in the times of Jesus by Joachim Jeremias, the betrothal ceremony, which in our opinion, though not by oriental standards, took place at an extremely early age, began the transfer of the girl from her father's power to her husband's. The usual age for a girl's betrothal was between 12 and 12 and a half. But there is incontestable evidence of betrothals and marriages at an even earlier age. Again, something totally foreign to our life and circumstances today. But that's what it was like in those early days. So we met Mary. We'll learn more about her in a little bit. But also Joseph is the father, as we've seen, as was 
supposed. A very interesting phrase. He is of the house of David. That's noted in uh, chapter 2, verse 4. When uh, they were going to the census, Joseph went from, up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David. Now we need to remember that although Joseph was not involved in the process, he was nonetheless fully regarded as Christ's father, allowing Christ to legally possess a royal lineage. Mary, is also, Mary also has a royal connection to the house of David. So there's a legal and physical connection there, that to the Jews was airtight. Legally, any child born to Mary during this engagement would be considered Joseph's if he accepted the care of the child. However, it was Mary who provided the physical connection. You remember even in a leveret marriage, a child born by the wife and husband's relative was identified as what? the child of the dead father. And we are also aware that Matthew and Luke recognize this reality when they give the genealogy of Jesus. Jesus is the child of Joseph's. He is his father, although Mary is a virgin. Now, verses 28 through 30, a very particular thing about... We, we know the family... And the family is met with favor. Coming in, he, Gabriel, said to her, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. Gabriel greets her as a recipient of divine blessing because God has chosen her for this, to be involved in this special task. But why would Mary, of all people, have this privilege? What made her the right choice or the prime candidate to become the mother of the Son of God? Well, what do you think? It's a trick question, isn't it? Because the idea of being favored is the word for grace in the Greek. She at this very moment and for the rest of her life she, she was a human just like us. She was a sinner. She was guilty of sin. She, she didn't live perfectly holy all of her life. She was in need of God's grace. We know she was a person just like us, with a nature just like ours. But because of the Latin Vulgate's translation of this verse, instead of favored one, it says full of grace. And so, as such, certain interpretators took that to be that she was the dispenser or the possessor and dispenser of grace. That salutation has been confiscated to form the basis of the familiar Roman Catholic prayer known as the Ave Maria, right? Hail Mary. The premise of that prayer, based on the Latin Vulgate's rendering of favored one as gratia plena, full of grace, is that Mary has been granted and possesses fullness of grace, which she then bestows on others. In his encyclical, Pope Pius X, in a bizarre distortion of the truth, has called Mary not the recipient of grace, but the dispenser of of all the gifts that our Savior purchased for us by His death and by His blood, the supreme minister of the distribution of graces, the distributor of the treasures of His merits. Pope Leo XIII agreed, declaring in his encyclical, that Mary is the intermediary through whom is distributed unto us the immense treasure of mercies gathered by God. Pope Pius IX cited the Catholic Church's belief that Mary is the seat of all divine graces, adorned with all gifts of the Holy Spirit, and almost 
infinite treasury and inexhaustible abyss of these gifts. Summing up the Catholic view that Mary is the mediator of all graces, Ludwig Ott writes, Since Mary's assumption into heaven, no grace is conferred on man without her actual intercessory cooperation. The teaching of Roman Catholicism that there is no surer or more direct road than by Mary for uniting all mankind in Christ and obtaining through him the perfect adoption of sons, that we may be holy and immaculate in the sight of God. Well, that's false. That's blasphemous. And yet, as to the word Mariolatry, a Catholic dictionary edited by Donald Atwater bristles and declares that the word means idolatrous worship of the Blessed Virgin Mary with which Catholics have been and by the ignorant still are frequently charged. And yet, if you read throughout that, and as we have just seen with the direct declarations of various popes, that they exalt Mary to the place of Christ. Even, in fact, probably more important than Christ. Because without Mary, it's impossible to be united. In fact, they say at her conception, she was preserved by God from all stain of original sin. She was betrothed to a carpenter, Joseph, at the Annunciation. The second person of the Blessed Trinity took flesh in her womb by the power of the Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost. But her marriage to Joseph took place in due course. She gave birth at Bethlehem to Jesus, the God-man, both before and after her miraculous childbearing. She was a virgin and so remained all her days according to the unanimous and perpetual tradition and teaching of the church. After her death, her body was taken up into heaven, the assumption, Mary is the mother of Jesus, Jesus is God, therefore she is the mother of God. Now this is correct, it is theological true, theologically true, but that she remained her whole life absolutely sinless is affirmed by the Council of Trent, which we of course know to be false. As the second Eve, Mary is the spiritual mother of all living, says Catholics venerate her with an honor above that accorded to other saints, but different from the divine worship given to God only. They pray to her, and she in heaven intercedes with her Son, God the Son, for them, recognizing that Mary is a creature and that all her dignity comes from God, devotion to her is far removed from the idolatry that stupid prejudice has sometimes associated with it. I think that's a little far-fetched of a claim, isn't it? They say it is a link binding men to God based on the fact that she is the mother of God. But we see that this is unbiblical for several reasons. First of all, she's a sinner, isn't she? Romans chapter 3 in verse 10 says that there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But also in Romans 3, we also see that she is not the Redeemer. Verse 24 says, being justified as a gift by whose grace? His grace, Christ's grace. God's grace, through the redemption which is in whom? Christ Jesus. And nowhere in the righteousness of God through faith, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and prophets, and how we are able to experience the propitiation in His blood through faith in receiving it, maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Nowhere in that passage does Paul mention Mary. Nowhere. 
But then also one other point. This is not an exhaustive rebuttal, of course. But in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5, we learn that she is not our intercessor. She is not the mediator. Because Paul says, 1 Timothy 2, 5, For there is one God and one mediator also between God and men. It's the man, Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the witness for this proper time. But I think more than that, she would have never accepted this type of undue praise and promotion. That's not the type of woman she was. Notice back in Luke one thirty-eight that she identifies herself as the slave of God. May it be done to me according to your word that she was completely submissive to the will of God. That whatever he said for her to do, she was going to do because she saw herself in a place of submission. But also note in verse 47, when she magnifies the Lord, she says, My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit has rejoiced in what? In whom? God, my Savior. My question is, who needs a Savior? Is it perfect people who have no sin? Or is it a sinner in need of the grace of God? Only sinners need a Savior. Well, all of that goes back to the question that we asked a few minutes ago. Why was Mary the prime candidate to be the mother of Jesus? Well, it's not because of her, but it was as Luke says, the Lord is with you. The Lord is with you. The Lord had chosen her specifically and was going to equip her with what she needed. Well, there is a special grace extended to women here. Since another woman, Eve, had opened the door for sin to come into the world, bringing down the curse of God on womankind, now the Lord is opening the history of salvation through a different woman, the God-fearing and submissive Mary. Through her and her maternal role, the Lord has restored the honor of women, replacing the curse with a blessing because of her son. Now Mary receives this greeting. She's startled. She's Shock. She's perplexed at this statement. She was pondering what kind of greeting this was. It's a, a reference to intense curiosity and concern. You can imagine the scene. An angel is right here telling me that the Lord is with me and that he says I'm the recipient of divine favor and grace, that he is present with me. I'm not really understanding why. What purpose do I need this grace? What is he going to have me do since he's here? And the angel responds, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Why would God choose to give Mary grace? She would have been perhaps a little scared too because she's a sinner. An angel is talking to her about God using her. It could be a sign of judgment. But yet like Noah, she has found favor. And all throughout we see the demonstration of their humility and their desire to be faithful and righteous, which is very commendable. In Isaiah chapter 66, verse 2, the prophet records the words of the Lord by saying, My hand 
made all these things. Thus all these things came into being, declares Yahweh. But to this one I will look, to him who is humble and contrite of heart, and who trembles at my word. As we see with Isaiah in chapter 6, verse 5, Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips, or even Peter in Luke chapter 5, verse 8, when he encounters Jesus and he says, Simon saw the miracle of the fish. He fell down at Jesus' knees and saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. Sinners are humble because they are aware of who they are in the sight of God. But Gabriel then lets Mary know she is not to be afraid because she is going to be a beacon of blessing instead of a cause for judgment. As an expression of divine working, Favor signifies God's gracious choice of someone through whom God does something special. Noah is spared from the flood. Gideon is chosen to judge Israel. Hannah is given a child in barrenness. David receives back the Ark of the Covenant. In fact, in the Old Testament, that phrase often involves a request granted on the condition that someone had favor with God. So Gideon, Hannah, and David... However, here this favor is announced without any kind of request, any hint of a request. It is freely bestowed. In fact, the noun charis, grace or favor, is used only by Luke in the synoptics. It becomes a key word in Acts to describe what God does for his people out of his good pleasure. Mary is about to receive freely the special favor of God. She's a picture of those who receive God's grace on the basis of His kind initiative. What great encouragement for us today, isn't it? As young and inexperienced as Mary was, she was highly aware of who she was and what she was capable of doing. She was faithful and obedient. She was pure. She was contemplative of what she heard from the Lord. In fact, she was also ready to be a vessel of blessing, despite being a sinner in need of grace. What a great blessing to the world when we are ready to be used by God. It's important to know what we believe about Mary because so many people go wrong at this point. The Bible never says that Mary was without sin, that she remained a virgin, or that she is able to give grace to sinners. I think that we could imagine how much that would grieve her to know that some people do worship her. But what the Bible does say beyond the fact that she was the mother of Jesus is that she was saved by grace. The way Mary helps us is not by giving us grace, but by showing that God can give us the same kind of grace that He gave to her. Mary is the blessed virgin who alone was called to give birth to the Son of God. Her experience is not our experience. Nevertheless, her example is for us. Since she received grace from God, her example proves that God shows unmerited favor to lowly sinners. And even when we feel small and insignificant, overlooked by the world, can anything good come out of Nazareth? We can know that God is for us. Gabriel's greeting shows God's grace for the lowly. Mary's faith in God was powerful. It's admirable for all of us today. We need to believe in the Word of God and have confidence in it. We need to be ready to obey the will of God, whether it be unpredictable and difficult or a plain command. And we need to be so humble that God is seen through us and is able to work through us. 
When I think back about Mary, I'm reminded of a couple passages that don't mention her by name, but they certainly describe her. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus begins with the Beatitudes. Matthew chapter 5 says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the lowly, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. But I'm also reminded of what Peter wrote to the dispersion. In 1 Peter chapter 3, as we consider the example of Mary and how she conducted herself, even just from this small amount of verses we saw, when she receives this news, we know that one day when, well, as the betrothed to Joseph, and later her husband, and as Jesus is being raised as a child and into a man, I think this applies to her as well, and us today. First Peter chapter 3 begins, In the same way you wives be subject to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. As they observe your pure conduct with fear, your adornment must not be merely external, braiding the hair, wearing gold jewelry, or putting on garments, but let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible quality of a lowly and quiet spirit which is precious in the sight of God. For in this way in former times, the holy women also who hoped in God used to adorn themselves being subject to their own husbands, just as Sarah obeyed Abraham calling him Lord. You have become her children if you do good, not fearing any intimidation. He praises the wives, but then he also says you husbands. In the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way as with a weaker vessel, since she is a woman, and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life, so that your prayers will not be hindered. Sum up, all of you be like-minded, sympathetic, brotherly, tender-hearted, and humble in spirit. Mary certainly exemplifies these characteristics. And may we do so today. Not because she is our co-redeemer, our intercessor, or savior. But may we recognize that despite our sinfulness, that we can still please God, that God still chooses us despite ourselves, and that he is able to work in us and through us for the benefit of everyone around us. May we be a Mary as much as we can. But more than that, may we be submissive. May we be faithful. May we be open to God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the example of Mary that we have examined in this passage today. Even though there is a, a abuse of her reputation and status, there are certainly many commendable traits that we acknowledge with her and applaud her for. Lord, you chose a, a special person to fulfill your purposes, and I pray that we would desire to be the same type of person today for you. I pray that we are open to your word, that we are willing to obey you in everything that we need to. May we recognize that we are sinners in need of a Savior, just like Mary did. May we recognize that it is through you that we are able to enjoy eternal life. I pray that those who are in marriages and relationships that we demonstrate these great attributes 
of submission and humility and love, tenderheartedness. Even in our vulnerability, you protect us, you are with us. And it's in Christ's name we pray, amen. If you have any need for salvation this morning, please let that be known. If you need prayers, let that be shared as well, because we are here for one another as we stand and sing.